Hey, we are excitedly launching some new stuff here at Graceway. Pastor Tim is going to bring the encouragement in the first message of our new series called Living Waters. Also, to kick it off, Graceway Collective is going to get us pumped up with the brand new song called Louder. So turn up the volume and enjoy the new track. strong defender is our king the one who was and is and is to come with love enough to send his only son come on, his son could we will sing louder to the God who hears us even when we whisper to the glory of our king who fights our battle Louder will be available on all streaming platforms on June 5th. Throughout history, Jesus has been described a lot of ways. Even the Bible has several different names and descriptions ascribed to him. In a conversation with the Samaritan woman, Jesus refers to himself as the living water for all people. Let's see what that means for us. Graceway, Pastor Tim here. So excited to have you join us this morning as we begin this new series, Living Water. I'm actually at Lake Giacomo right now. Uh, Pastor Jeremy and I were just watching as fish were literally jumping out of the lake, just begging to be caught. So if you're looking to uh, socially distance and do some fishing, I can highly recommend for you Lake Giacomo here in Lee's Summit. I'm excited about this series. We're probably going to be in it for five weeks. We're going to come to you from different lakes and rivers and fountains across our city uh, just to remind you that there are things that are happening outside of your house that you've been in for the last 
six weeks, but mostly I'm excited because my heart in this series is just to remind you of God's heart for you, to remind you of what God says it feels like to be in a relationship with Him, that it's not stagnant, it's not dry, it's, it's living, it's alive, it's encouraging. And I know that that's something that we need right now. And so when you go to the New Testament, you, you begin in, in four books that are called the Gospels. In each of the Gospels are a historical testimony of an individual about their understanding of who Jesus was and what he was like and, and what his message was. So Matthew is writing to the Jews and he introduces Jesus as the Messiah, as the King. And so there's lots of prophecies about who the Messiah was going to be and what he was going to be like in the book of Matthew. Mark is writing to the Romans and, and he's talking about Jesus as the, as the perfect uh, servant, as the suffering servant. And so we see a lot of Jesus's miracles and a lot of Jesus's works and a lot of things that Jesus did. It's the shortest, most abbreviated book. Luke is writing to the Greeks and it's talking about Jesus as the perfect man. He's, he's entirely God and he's entirely man. And so Luke talks the most about Jesus's relationships. We're going to spend the most of our time in the Gospel of John, and the audience for the Gospel of John is kind of open. It's, it's come one, come all, and John, the Apostle John, probably Jesus' best friend when he lived on this earth, is talking about Jesus as the Son of God. And one of the things that John does is he introduces Jesus using kind of everyday themes. Jesus loved to teach just looking around and bringing spiritual truth in with kind of temporal and, and earthly things. And so in the book of John, we see the seven I am's where Jesus says, hey, I'm the light. Uh, Jesus is the light. You're in the dark. You're in a confusing. You're in a despairing time. You, you need Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the bread that the, the human soul has hungers and, and desires. And Jesus says, hey, I'm the one who can fulfill that for you. Jesus says, I'm the shepherd. You need protection. You need direction. You need Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the door. You want a relationship with God? It starts, starts with me. Uh, you got you to gotta come through me because I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But one of Jesus' favorite ways, and really one of the favorite ways of the Bible, to describe who God is, and it's one that, that John uses, a story that John tells of, uh, of Jesus talking to us about another person of the Trinity, the person of the Holy Spirit. And in John chapter 7, I want you to hear how he describes him. The Bible says on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out. So picture this, everyone's kind of gathered, uh, they're, they're celebrating this feast together, and Jesus stands up and starts yelling. Right? And he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow, here it is, rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit with whom we believed in him to receive, for as yet the spirit has not been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now, please understand, Jesus is in the middle of a Jewish feast and he stands up and yells, Anyone who's thirsty, come to me and I, I'll fulfill you. I'll quench your thirst. And not only that, but I'll put the Holy Spirit inside of you so that you'll never be thirsty again. Now, this is important because in spite of so much art that I see, Jesus was not a blonde-haired, blue-eyed European, right? Jesus was a Jew. He was a Middle Easterner. Uh, he probably had brown skin and dark hair and dark eyes. Um, and, and Jesus lives in the middle of the desert. Uh, in fact, this series, uh, I was introduced to this series through a church in Dubai. I was in Dubai recently and went to Fellowship Church. Pastor Jim Burgess, shout out to Pastor Jim and Fellowship Church. This is an amazing church, one of the most diverse churches I've ever been in. I thought Graceway was diverse. We, we, we got some space to go. Uh, over 90 countries represented in the middle of the desert. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Dubai. It's a pretty fantastic city. If you Google Dubai, you're going to see all kinds of skyscrapers and, and beautiful buildings and architecture. And you're probably going to see the ocean side, right? And you're going to, you're going to think to yourself, oh, this is, this is like a tropical place. And one side of it is Dubai is a Gulf Coast country, one of seven Gulf Coast countries. It's about 40 miles away from Iran. But you don't have to go very far and you are in the desert. And when I say the desert, I mean no water anywhere. 
I mean 115 degrees and 60 to 70 percent humidity. Everywhere you look is just brush and sand and sun and hot and you're thirsty and you're thinking if I get stuck out here without water I'm not gonna make it. Jesus stands up in the middle of this and he says if anyone's thirsty and probably everyone's like we're living in a desert Jesus of course we're thirsty. Jesus says come to me. Come to me and I'll I'll quench your thirst. Come to me and I'll fulfill you. Come to me and not only will I fulfill you, but I'll put something inside of you that you're never thirsty again. Jesus loved to use this example of rivers of living water, but he isn't the first one to use it. In fact, if you go to the Old Testament, you see that the prophets love to talk about God and the Holy Spirit and the presence of God, of being like rivers of living water. One of those is in the book of Jeremiah. Listen to what it says in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13 God is talking to his people and he says y'all have committed two evils you have forsaken me the fountain of living water you've forsaken you you have turned away from me the one who can quench your thirst and you have hewed out cisterns for yourself broken cisterns that can hold no water this verse is the reason that I wanted to do this series because how many of you know that anytime we're in the midst of suffering, we're in the midst of difficulty, we try to find ways to keep ourselves busy. We try to find ways to keep ourselves distracted. We try to find ways to fulfill us. And we do all kinds of different things. And how many know sometimes it works for a little bit. That new job, it'll work for a little bit. That, that raise, it'll work for a little bit. That new house, that new video game, that, that new movie, that new shirt. It, listen, it'll work for a little bit. But Jesus says, I got something against y'all. I offered you something inside of you so that you're never thirsty again. And you kept not believing me. You kept not taking me at my word. And you kept going to, to other cups with holes in the bottom. Jesus says, if you want to be fulfilled, you got to know me. I'll give you something that will quench your thirst for all eternity. To some, Jesus is a light. To some, he is bread. And still to others, he is the good shepherd. Jesus is posing the question, who do you say I am? It's a question worth reflecting on. Jesus is asking, who am I to you? So even though I think it's fair to assume, and most theologians agree that Jesus is quoting Jeremiah, the one who uses the example, the illustration to teach us about God as living water is actually a contemporary of Jeremiah's. His name is Ezekiel. Now, maybe you've never read the book of Ezekiel. I, I wouldn't be mad at you if you hadn't. It's a long book, and it's confusing from beginning to end. And so I want to help you a little bit with the context of the book so we understand why it's so powerful for Ezekiel to describe God as a river of living water. Uh, God had prophesied that the people of Israel who were rebelling against him, who were following other gods, who were doing horrible atrocities in the name of pagan gods, that he was going to send them into exile for 70 years. And from 607 to 537, to the date, that's exactly what he did, does. It begins with a battle. It's a famous battle in history. If you're, if you're a history buff, you've probably heard of it. It's the ba Battle of Cargamish, and it's, it's between Babylon, who's the world power at the time, and the Egyptians, who had teamed up with the Assyrians. These are the two world powers, and they kind of meet on the border of modern-day Turkey and Syria, and they have what is just a world-class battle that the Babylonians just absolutely trounce the Egyptians, and, and they kind of assert world dominance. And on the way back home, Babylon is modern-day Iraq, they stop off in Israel, and they basically say, hey, Israel, we just showed everyone we're the baddest dudes on the block. And so unless you want us to do the same to you, you're going to pay taxes. And we're going to take the very best of your culture, of your young people. They're going to become our slaves. We're going to teach them in our ways. And the king of Israel comes out. He bows the knee to Nebuchadnezzar. And, and, and the Babylonians do exactly that. They begin to put tariffs and taxes on the Israelites. They take the very best of culture and of young people into exile. And for about 10 years, it stays that way until one of the Hebrew kings decides, you know what, out of sight, out of mind, I don't want to pay these taxes anymore. And so they kind of put out a declaration that we're not going to pay these taxes. We're not going to put up with any of this. And so Nebuchadnezzar does the obvious thing. He gets his army together and he, he comes back. 
And he does the exact same thing a second time. He takes another group of the very best and of the very brightest. He raises the taxes and the tariffs on the people of Israel. He does some damage to Jerusalem, the city, and just kind of reasserts his power and reasserts that he's not anyone to be, to be trifled with. Ezekiel probably would have been taken in this second exile. Most prophets, when you think about even minor and major prophets in the Bible, you think of them as old guys kind of walking around saying, I got a word from the Lord, right? That, like Ezekiel would have been a young man. He would have been probably an, ac uh, uh, an academic. He would have been somebody who was very bright. And, and the Babylonians take him into captivity. We know that he wrote the book of Ezekiel and had visions in Babylon, that he probably died in captivity. Now, about 15 years later, like all of us, the Israelites, they don't learn their lesson. And the, the king of Israel at that time decides again that he doesn't want to pay tariffs and taxes, that he doesn't want to bow the knee. And, and this time, ba Babylon comes and Nebuchadnezzar comes, and he decides that he's going to do something so terrible and so atrocious that the point is forever made. And he he levels the city of Jerusalem. He literally doesn't let one rock sit on top of another. And it's one of the most horrific times in the history of Israel. It's one of the most brutal times. And you can read about it in the Kings and the Chronicles and a lot of the major and minor prophets. And, and Ezekiel writes the majority of the book of Ezekiel about the judgment of God. In fact, chapter 1 to 33 is all about the judgment of God. And it's not until chapter 40 we see that God comes to, to Ezekiel and he gives him a vision for redemption. He gives him a vision of hope. He gives him a vision of what could be. And in Ezekiel chapter 40, in verses 1 through 4, it says, In the 25th year of exile, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year after the city was struck down, on that very day. Don't you love the specificity of Ezekiel here? It's almost like he said it was a balmy 74 and the Royals won 4-2 that evening. It's almost like a weather report. It says that the hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me to the city. Now it's referenced as the city, but we know that he was probably looking at Jerusalem. And in visions of God, he brought me to the land of Israel and he set me down on a very high mountain on which was a structure like a city to the south. When he brought me there, behold, there was a man whose appearance was like a bronze and a linen cord and a measuring reed in his hand. And he was standing in the gateway and he said to me, Son of man, look with your eyes and hear with your ears and set your heart upon all that I will show you. For you were brought here in order that I might show it to you to declare all that you see to the house of Israel. There's a picture that I want to show you. It's probably very similar to what Ezekiel was looking at at the time of this, this vision. This bronze individual was an angel of God. He has a measuring cord in his hand, and he's about to show Ezekiel the restoration of the city of Jerusalem and the restoration of the people of God. He's probably looking from the northeast corner of the city. If you're looking down, you can see on the other side is the south side to your left is the east and to your right is the west. On the west side of the city to the top right would have been where the temple is. And the Bible lets us know in Ezekiel chapter 47 verses 1 through 12 that the angel takes Ezekiel to the door of the temple. And I want you to follow along with me, Ezekiel 47 verses 1 through 12. And we're going to see the vision that God gives to the prophet Ezekiel. Here it is. Then he brought me back to the temple door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was flowing from below the south end of the thresh, threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around to the outside of the outer gate that faces toward the east, and behold, the water was trickling out on the south side. Going on eastward with a measuring line in his hand, the man, the angel, measured a thousand cubits. The cubit was essentially the size of your hand from the bottom of your palm to the tip of your fingers. If you had an especially large hand, it was literally called a large cubit. This is a thousand cubits. It's about 1,750 feet. And then he led me through the water, and it was ankle deep. So coming out of the temple is this trickle. And the angel leads prophet Ezekiel into the water, about 1,750 feet of water that Ezekiel describes 
as being ankle deep. Verse 4, again, he measured a thousand and he led me through the water and it was knee deep. It's getting, it's getting deeper. Again, he measured a thousand. He led me through the water and it was waist deep. Verse 5, again, he measured a thousand, another 1,750 feet. And it was a river that I could not pass through for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in a river that could not be passed through. And he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. The angel leads Ezekiel to a vision of the city restored, of the temple of God, and coming out of the temple of God is a trickle that turns into a river that's so deep that Ezekiel can't get through it. He's, he's literally swimming in the river that had come out of the temple, and the angel says, Zeke, you see this? You see, you see what's coming? You see this vision? I want you to make sure that you're paying attention so that you can see what God's about to do. Verse 7, I went back and I saw on the bank of the river very many trees on the one side and the other. And he said to me, the water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into Araba and enters the sea. It would have been the Mediterranean Sea. And the water flows into the sea and the water will become fresh. In other words, the water that comes out of this temple that's now a river is going to go to the Mediterranean Sea, which is a salt body of water. And as soon as that water out of the temple touches the Mediterranean Sea, it's going to make that water fresh. Verse 9, For wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live, and there will be very many fish. For this water goes there, and the waters of the sea become fresh. So everything will live where the river goes. The angel says everything this river touches comes to life. It flourishes. It's abundant. It, it's, it's magnificent to be a part of. Verse 10, fishermen will stand beside the sea from En Gedi to en Englam. It will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be the ver of very many kinds like the fish of the great sea. Verse 11, an interesting thing. But its swamps and its marshes will not become fresh. They are all to be left for salt. Why? Because even God's very best plans sometimes people reject. Some of us, God offers us freshness. God offers us new life. And we say, no, nah, I'll stay salty, right? I'll stay bitter. I'll stay lifeless. I'll, I'll stay dry. And even in this prophecy, even in this vision, there are places that choose to not receive the living water of God. Verse 12, and on the banks on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fruit every month. New fruit crop every month, because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food, and their leaves for healing. This is the vision that the angel comes from God to give the prophet Ezekiel. Now, if you picture that city, Jerusalem, that I showed you earlier, you want to picture that up and to the right is this river that's coming out, and the water is kind of coming toward Ezekiel. And right at the spot where you see that little river begin to flow, right at those trees, it says that that river coming from the temple splits. One continues, goes into the Mediterranean Sea and makes it fresh water. The other goes to Ezekiel's right, to the, to the east, and it would have gone to what we know as the Dead Sea. And the Bible says that the vision is that every place that that river touches, other than those marshes and swamps, becomes full of life. It becomes full of, of fruit and of fish, and there's trees on both sides, and there's an economy that, spot, that, that sprouts around it, that fishermen are able to go in and get everything that they need for it. Now, now we, we don't always understand this. We think that this is just like a, a creek or a crick, depending upon where you come from, that is just kind of going. This is 40 kilometers. I actually have a picture for you so you can kind of understand Jerusalem is in the middle, and on both sides coming out of that city are rivers of living water with trees and fruit and fish and beauty and life and abundance on both sides. Everything it touches, the Mediterranean Sea, the Dead Sea, is brought to life in an instance. This, it's God's vision. This is God's hope. This is the prophecy that God gives to Ezekiel. Imagine the pain and desperation of being in an extended exile. Some of us may be feeling the same desperation right now with the current state of the world. If you want someone to talk to about it, we have your back. We have pastors and leaders who would love to connect with you. Just give the number on the screen a call. 
Everything we do at Graceway is fueled by the generosity of everyday people, people like you and I, and a ton of other families who practice the spiritual act of giving. We believe that when we give joyfully, God meets us in powerful ways. If you want to safely worship through giving, go to visitgraceway.org slash give. Because of generous people like you, we were able to launch an initiative to feed families in Kansas City called Unite in Crisis. Through Unite in Crisis, about 100 families that are experiencing hardship due to COVID-19 are receiving groceries every week. Volunteers are packing a week's worth of meals for families to pick up on Sunday afternoons. We have seen powerful gathering around Jesus' words in Matthew 25 when he said, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. If you are feeling compelled to help in any way, you can visit uniteincrisis.org. What is God trying to communicate to Ezekiel and to the people of Israel? And what does it have to do with us? We know in a historic sense, this is God sending an angel, giving the prophet Ezekiel a vision of his hopes for the people of Israel. They're in exile at this time, but God doesn't want them to stay in exile. God wants them to live in freedom and to flourish. God wants them to rebuild the temple, which was the center of his relationship to them, and that their worship wouldn't just stay in that structure, but that it would pour out of the temple and that it would bless the entire region. This was always God's heart for the people of Israel, that their relationship to him would be so vibrant that it would pour out into not just the region, but into the entire world, and that people's experience with God would feel like being next to a river of living water where there was life and, and bounty and beauty everywhere that you looked. We know historically that the people of Israel didn't share God's hope, that many of them stayed in exile even when they were allowed to leave. They, they stayed in bondage even though they were officially free, and that those who did come back, they rebuilt a temple, but it was a shadow of its former glory. History tells us that old men who had seen the old temple, Solomon's temple, and the new temple wept when it was done because they knew that it wasn't even close to what God wanted. Prophetically, we know that this is a, a vision of something that's still to come that God's hope is to send Jesus back to this earth that he created and that he loves. It's Jesus' second coming. And when Jesus comes to this earth, he's going to come to a place. He's going to come to the Middle East. And his plan is that his presence is going to create flourishing in the entire region. I think that some of us, we think that heaven is a place that we go and that we go up into the clouds and we turn into chubby angels and we get uh, officially donated a harp and that, that's what heaven is. No, heaven is here. Heaven is on earth where Jesus comes back and reclaims what is his. And how many of you know when Jesus comes back, he's not going to come back and just give us a slight upgrade. He's going to come back and he's going to take a place that was a, a picture of brutality and of bondage, a, a desert, and he's going to turn it into a garden. The language in the book of Ezekiel is, is actually the same language that we see in the book of Genesis, the, the language of the Garden of Eden, that the story of the Bible begins in a garden and the story of the Bible ends in a garden, that God comes to this place, to this earth, and that he reestablishes his kingdom and his will, and, and it's going to feel like being next to a river of living water. It's going to be full of beauty and, and fulfillment and purpose and joy, and, and there's going to be an economy of worship that's connected to it. This is, this is God's heart for us. But I think the third thing is that this is what the presence of God feels like. Remember that if you lived during this time, you, you went to the temple to experience God. Now, the Bible tells us, and we saw in the book of John, that that Jesus' hope for us is that, that we wouldn't have to go someplace to experience God, but that God would be inside of us, and that out of us would flow what a, a river of living water. And in this vision, I want you to see four things about the presence of God that I, that I want you to experience in this season, that I want your relationship with God to feel these four ways. The first thing is that I want you to see that this river of living water, it's, it's completely unstoppable, right? 
the, the, the temple, uh, when Ezekiel goes up to it, he, he sees a trickle and, and he steps into that river, that trickle, and, it, and it's up to his ankles. And then he goes another almost 2,000 feet and it's up to his knees. And then he goes up and it's up to his waist. And then he goes another 1,750 feet and, and he's swimming. And at this point, it's a, it's a force of nature. Can I tell you the presence of God? Sometimes it feels like a trickle but I'll always promise you that it will turn into a force of nature. Think about the ministry of Jesus. Jesus comes to this earth, and, and Jesus could have come riding a bolt of lightning and, and, and like a tornado or an earthquake or a tsunami, but instead he's, he comes like a trickle. He's born of a virgin in an inconsequential place, Nazareth. In fact, during his lifetime, people would say, can anything good come out of Galilee, the place that Jesus has come? That's, that's like... It's like a trickle, right? And if you think about the life of Jesus, you think about that we don't really know anything about his life until he's, until he's 30. We know how he's born. He shows up around 12 at the temple talking about needing to do his father's business, but there's not much to it. His ministry lasts for three years, and then from a purely logical standpoint, ends, ends in failure, right? He, he's, he's hung on a cross, and and we believe that he rose again, but it, it doesn't, feel, doesn't feel like an enormous thing. But think about what it's become. Think about what the resurrection began. You, you could say that maybe the resurrection was just knee deep, but how many of you know now 2,000 years later, we're swimming in the blessing, the unstoppable plan and purposes of God that's given to us on the cross and in the empty tomb. The presence of God sometimes begins as a trickle, but it turns into a force of nature. I, I think about even my own life. I, I grew up in the church, and my relationship to God growing up in the church was, it was dry. Uh, I knew things about God, but it, it didn't fulfill. It didn't bring flourishing. It, it didn't bring joy, and, and God chose to save me when I was 16 years old, and I prayed a prayer on October 18th, 1994, and I, I prayed probably not a great prayer, right? Let's just call it a trickle prayer. I prayed something like, God, if you really are who you say you are, all these things I learned in Bible class and VBS and the churches that I, I grew up in, then, then I give you my life, and, and please don't mess it up. Not much of a force of nature prayer. God called me into the ministry when I was 18 years old, I became a youth pastor when I was 21, and then I was a senior pastor in Cincinnati, and then in Madison, Wisconsin, and then back to Indianapolis, and now in, in Kansas City. And, and can I tell you now, years later, um, I can't possibly imagine my life without God. I can't possibly imagine where I would be and who I would be. God's literally taken me all over the world, and, and I feel like, man, I'm just getting started. I feel like at 42, now in the place that I feel like God's going to have me for the rest of my life, I think I'm maybe just waist deep, right? And I'm looking forward to that full swimming in the glory and grace of God in this place. Man, I hope that you know that the presence of God, it, it doesn't always, it doesn't always feel like you're in a river surrounded by beauty, but it always ends up there. It always ends up there. That's God's plan and God's purpose for your life. The second thing that I want you to see that's so important is that the river is, it's miraculous. It, it's miraculous. It, it, remember that Jesus is, is, is talking about a desert, right? Jerusalem is, it's in a desert and, and, and that river trickles down to the Dead Sea and, and into the Mediterranean Sea and anything that it touches is brought back to life. You know that the presence of God is like that, right? Sometimes it feels like a trickle and sometimes it feels like a tsunami, but I, I will tell you that the plans and purposes of God and His presence in your life is to bring all the dead and dying and dry parts back to life. That, that's God's hope for you. That's God's plan for you. That's the prophetic vision <laughs> that God has. And not just for you. God wants the testimony of your life to be, I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lame, but now I walk. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. I once was in sin and bondage, but now I'm forgiven and free. And He wants you to not only experience the miracle for yourself, but He wants other people to see the testimony of your life and to say, that dude couldn't have come up with that on his own. 
That guy couldn't have been that. That gal couldn't have experienced that. That, that. that person would have never been, done, said, lived out that kind of thing unless something miraculous happened. You see, in the presence of God, not only do we experience the unstoppable power of God, but we experience the miraculous transformation of God. And, and I, I want to I tell you today, the only way that you can be changed, it's not based on what you know. It's not based on how many verses you got memorized. It's based on whether or not you're spending time in the presence of God. You get into the presence of God and you can't help but be changed. You can't help but be different. And what God's trying to say is, my hope for you is that you can be a part of this miraculous movement that I'm doing, this thing where I'm bringing life and flourishing, not only to you, but to the whole region and to the whole world so that anybody that comes in contact with you experiences God's blessing for you and God's blessing for them. Number three, it's, it's deep. The presence of God is deep beyond measure. Remember, Ezekiel starts and it's up to his ankles. And then it's up to his knees. And then it's up to his waist. And then he's, he's swimming in it, right? And, and, you know, I've been studying the Bible and trying to walk with God for less than some, but more than many. And can I tell you, I, I feel like I've got more questions, glad questions now than I did when I began. I feel like I, I know God and I enjoy God and I, I can't wait to spend the rest of my life, however, however much time God gives me, trying to get my arms around the depth of His perfection, the depth of His grace, the depth of His forgiveness. I, I don't think you ever get to the spot, please understand, Christian, you don't ever master God. You don't ever master the Bible. You just, you just swim in it. You just enjoy it. You're just fulfilled and directed by it. And I want to I wanna challenge you today because some of us, man, we're, we're, we're ankle deep in our relationship with God and wondering why we're not enjoying it. Can I tell you, some of us, we, we're, we're giving God some. We're giving God, okay, I'll, I'll go knee deep. When I really get in trouble, well, maybe I'll go up to my thigh. But, but I'm not, I'm not going to... I'm not going to cannonball into this thing called Christianity, right? <laughs> like, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to turn into that guy. Can I tell you the only way you experience the force of nature, miraculous transformation of God, is if you go to the deep end, plug your nose, and jump in like a fool. That's the only way. And some of you, you say, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll come to church sometimes, but I'm not doing a small group. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'll do a small group, but, but uh, I'm not going to growth track. No, I'm, I'm, like a, I, I'm not serving. I, I'm not giving. I, I'm, I'm definitely not going to talk to people about my faith. I'm, listen, I'm definitely not going to take risks that, that God's going to have to show up. And I, I, I'm, I'm content staying in this need deep faith. And, and you can do that, right? You, you, can, you, can, you can build a temple that's a shadow of God's best plan. You, you, can, you can have a facade of faith and of religion, and, and, and God's not going to be mad at you, and, and God's not going to judge you, and, and we're not going to judge you. But, but I just want to tell you that there's more. Uh, there's more to it. There's, there's more beauty. There's more flourishing. There's, there's more hope. There's more joy. There's more life the deeper you go. It's not always easy. Right? It's, it's, not always, it's not always the most comfortable, but it's always good. It's always good. Being in the presence of God is always good. Going where God wants you to go, it's, it's always good. Trusting God, it's always good. Just leaning in in faith, leaning into God's Word and into God's people, into God's worship, and into the calling that God has on your life. I, I don't know where it might take you, uh, but I know it'll be good. Ezekiel sees this, this vision of, of the presence of God coming out of the temple, right? And it's unstoppable. In fact, whenever you look at the region that the temple was in, that river had to go uphill, right? It's so miraculous and so powerful. It goes uphill and then downhill and uphill, and that's how the presence of God is. It's, it's unstoppable. It's miraculous. It's deep. And then, and then it's number four, it's not supposed to stay in the temple, the, the water, Ezekiel doesn't have to go into the temple to experience the presence of God. Ezekiel's outside of the temple and the presence of God is coming out. And, and this is a good word for us right now, Graceway. Because right now, uh, our version of the temple, right or wrong, is, 
on Blue Ridge Cutoff in Raytown. It's our church building, right? And I'm grateful for our church building, and I'm grateful for all of the things that we're able to go into to enjoy one another and enjoy the presence of God. But can I tell you, your faith's not just supposed to be in a building. Your faith's supposed to come out of the building. Your faith's supposed to be taken with you. Notice that the river isn't just in the temple. The river's coming out of the temple, and it's not just staying right around the church folks. No, it's blessing everybody. And we're in a season right now where, listen, we can't, we can't be in our building temporarily. And, and as much as I hate that, I think that God's putting us in an incredible spot to understand the opportunity of this vision, that the presence of God isn't in a place, it's in you. And it isn't just for you, it's for your neighbors. And it isn't just for your neighbors, it's for your city. You see, Graceway is in Kansas City by the grace of God, not just for Raytown, but for the whole region. And when we're walking with God, when we're experiencing the presence of God, when we're knowing and enjoying Him, and we're together in friendship, and we know the reason that God has called us and saved us, when we're intent on making a difference, watch what happens. The presence of God doesn't stay in the church, it comes pouring out. And you don't have to believe in God to experience the blessing of God when there's a people of God who understand God in that way. My heart for you in this season, my heart for me in this season that, is, that you would be experiencing God in such a way that even in the midst of pandemic, even in the midst of stress, even in the midst of worry, the presence of God is pouring out on you pouring out from you, pouring out to those that you love, pouring out to those that you work with. And people are experienced the blessing and the vision of the presence of God and they ain't even Christians. Come on, somebody. That's God's plan for us in this season. I know we want to get back in the building, but I want, I want the presence of God to be outside of our building and blessing our city. I love you today, man. This is, a, this is such an interesting time in in our city, in our country, in the world. And, and I think that we have a generational opportunity in front of us to not just come to church, to be the church, to be all the things that we talk about, to be all the things that we say are important, to be a blessing, not just to the people who come to the temple, but just to people who you bump into because the presence of God is so rich and so full in your life that it just pours out onto everybody that you touch. I love you in this season. I'm praying for you in this season. I'm trusting that God's speaking to you, that you're pursuing Him, that He's showing up in new and beautiful ways for His glory and our joy. I love you. I'm praying for you, and I'll see you soon.
Hey guys, Pastor Brandon here. Listen, hopelessness is a burden that we don't have to carry alone. It's quite the opposite. Jesus is a perfect example of hope and offers to take that burden from us. We believe a simple way that we can do that is by surrounding ourselves with friends. We have a hundred plus small groups that are safe places to make friends. Check them out at visitgraceway.org groups. Listen, Jesus is the breaker of chains. He's the defeater of death. Our salvation rests upon the shoulders of a roaring lion that conquers not just with strength and power, but with grace and mercy and tenderness. Jesus is our living hope. So let's continue worshiping together, y'all.
if you heard something today and want some prayer or just want to talk with someone, don't forget you can do so by calling the number below. We also want to invite you to Growth Track Week 4. If you want to make a difference in your life and in the lives of those around you, join us by registering at visitgraceway.org slash growth track. Life feels more full when you are making an impact. Last but certainly not least, we want you to join us next week as we continue with part two of Living Waters. Take care and have the most excellent week.